And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Amphicelius, which was a request from Morgan via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a diplodocid sauropod that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Colorado, U.S. It probably looked like other sauropods, specifically diplodocids. There's the long neck, the long whip-like tail, it walked on four legs, and of course it was very large. Hmm. That's probably what it's best known for, is its size. I'd say its size and the fact that it is mysteriously missing, but I'm sure you're going to talk about that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But first, it's estimated to be about 59 feet or 18 meters long and weigh 17 short tons, and I should say that's the estimates now. Yeah, and that's the species that's still considered Amphicelius, not the larger one that used to be Amphicelius. Well, there were three species, now we're down to one. But don't worry, I'll get into that. (laughs) So for a long time, Amphicelius was thought to be one of the largest known dinosaurs. Amphicelius altus, which is the type species and the species that's valid today, looks very similar to Diplodocus. It had long, thin hind limbs. The forelimbs were proportionally longer than other dinosaurs it was closely related to. It also had a long, slender femur. Now, as I mentioned, there were three species named at one point, Amphicelius altus, Amphicelius lattice, and Amphicelius fragilimus. And fragilimus is the one most people talk about. Mm -hmm. The biggest one. But again, there's only one valid species now. That's the type species, Amphicelius altus. Amphicelius fossils were found by Ormel William Lucas near Canyon City in Colorado back in 1877. And then it was described by Edward Drinker Cope shortly after, also in 1877. Cope received the fossils in October of that year and then named Amphicelius in December of that year. And that's because, maybe you've already guessed it, it was a Bone Wars dinosaur. (laughs) Of course it was. So, of course, you had to describe those quickly. Yeah, that's impressive. He got them in October and it was already described by December. Mm -hmm. Although back then a description was like two paragraphs, not... Sometimes. (laughs) Some more lengthier than others. Yeah. The genus name Amphocelius means both sides hollow. Cope in 1877 wrote about the fossils that Lucas sent him, quote, He also procured remains of two additional forms of gigantic size, fit rivals of the Camarasaurus, which I referred to the new genus Amphocelius. A species of tortoise was associated with these saurians and appears to have been abundant, end quote. (laughs) What was it doing with those turtles? I don't know, but it does seem to come up a lot. (laughs) Is it like how we find Deinonychus with Tenontosaurus, the Samphocelus with the turtles? No, Cope said nothing like that. (laughs) It wasn't feasting on a field of tortoises? No, oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Cope said that Amphocelus was, quote, allied to Camarasaurus. And he also wrote that Camarasaurus and Amphocelus, quote, attained to the most gigantic proportions, end quote. Now, Cope thought these fossils were from the Cretaceous, from around the same time as the Lalaps fossils that he also named. He said that there were differences in the vertebrae, and that's what made it distinct from Camarasaurus. And he described a lot of back vertebrae, a pubis, and femur. Later, Henry Osborne and Charles Mook described it as only having two vertebrae, as well as a pubis, femora, a tooth, ulna, that's part of the forelimb, and parts of the shoulder. These fossils were found near the holotype, and they were different from Camarasaurus, and they were found alongside a Camarasaurus. Hmm. So it's possible that even some of the back vertebrae got lost in that brief period of time from going from lots of back vertebrae to just two vertebrae. Well, hold on a second, because <laughs> Emmanuel Schopp and others questioned this assignment of fossils to Amphicelius when they were analyzing Diplodica Day in 2015. They did, however, accept the ulna as being part of Amphicelia. Hmm. So I'll talk about Amphicelia lattice first. Cope also named Amphicelius lattice based on a femur and tail vertebrae. Osborne and Mook in 1921 later said that that belonged to Camarasaurus, so they referred it to Camarasaurus supremus. It's because they found the fossils were more similar to Camarasaurus than Amphicelius. Okay. And they didn't want to name a new genus, so they... Actually, they even assigned it to an existing species, not even assigning it to making it Camarasaurus lattice. Yes. Now, later in 1998, Macintosh suggested that Amphicelius lattice was a synonym of Amphicelius altus. 
but now Amphicelius lattice is considered to be a synonym of Camarasaurus supremus. So that's how we got rid of that one. At least for now. Could always change later. That's true. <laughs> then there's Amphicelius fragilimus. And again, that's the one that has been talked about the most. The species name fragilimus refers to the fragility of the fossil. There were a lot of thin parts on this fossil. Mm -hmm. Which might have been part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. The Amphicelius fragilimus fossil was found near Camarasaurus supremus fossils by Lucas as well. Lucas shipped these to Cope in spring or early summer of 1878, and then Cope published about it that August. So again, very quick. Cope named Amphicelius fragilimus based on a large back vertebra, which has since been lost. He visited Lucas and the quarries where it was found in the summer of 1879 and wrote notes about more Amphicelius fragilimus fossils, a neural spine and femur, but those have also been lost. Oh man, I never knew that they had found more stuff. Me either, I was looking into this. Yeah. In 1994, there was an attempt to find the quarry where the Amphicelius bones were originally found, but the technique didn't work out. They used radar, but the density of the fossils were the same as the matrix that the bones were in, so they couldn't find the fossils. Oh yeah, they were trying to do that Jurassic Park style mm -hmm. scan in the ground move. It works sometimes, but unfortunately not often. Also, according to Kenneth Carpenter, the mudstone quote is nearly stripped down to the underlying sandstone, end quote. And based on local topography, this probably happened before Lucas found the Amphicelius fossil back in the 1800s. And that means if that's true, that most of the Amphicelius skeleton was probably destroyed a long time before he found even that neural spine. I see. So it's like that layer that had Amphicelius in it is probably pretty much gone. Yeah. But back to the vertebra, which Cope based the name on. So in 1878, Cope wrote about Amphicelius fragilimus that the, quote, dimensions of its vertebra much exceed those of any known land animal. <laughs> that is an understatement. The vertebra itself exceeds the dimensions of most entire animals. Yes. <laughs> Land or otherwise. Based on an illustration from 1878, the vertebra was about 8.9 feet or 2.7 meters tall. Oh, man. Though the illustration may have had a typographical error with the scale bar. There's been some debate over that. Mm hmm It's massive. Yes. Now, earlier estimates for Amphicelius fragilimus that it was 130 to 200 feet or 40 to 60 meters long and weighed up to 150 tons, which is massive. That's what was in the books that I grew up with as a kid. When they mentioned Amphicelius, mm -hmm. it would be like, you think Diplodocus is big. <laughs> and just wait. <laughs> We've got this one vertebra that was so huge. Imagine how big that dinosaur would have been. As you can imagine, there's some skepticism around the massive size of Amphicelius fragilimus. Mm -hmm. In 2015, Carrie Woodruff and John Foster found that the giant size of Amphicelius fragilimus was, quote, most likely an extreme overestimation, end quote. Yeah, that seems likely. <laughs> <laughs> Based on these previous estimates, if they were true, this large size, that would make Amphicelius fragilimus the largest vertebrate ever because the largest blue whale is about 98 feet or nearly 30 meters long. Yeah. Well, there are some dinosaurs that were over 100 feet. So if you're talking size by length, there were bigger animals. I guess it just depends how you define large. Yeah. I think you usually do it by weight. And I, from what I remember, I think a blue whale, I guess they can be up to 150 tons. And that would be like around this weight. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's really hard to imagine a land animal without that benefit of water supporting it weighing as much as a blue whale. Yes. But it's hard to imagine sauropods in general. So it's. <laughs> That's true. It's kind of hard to even imagine blue whales, even though we know they exist. Yeah. If you were to see one, it's not like we could see its entirety easily. Yeah. Yeah. Woodruff and Foster said that based on bone strength, muscle forces, and gravity, animals that lived on land could only get as heavy as about 100 tons, or 90,700 kilograms. They also said that larger animals need more food, and in the ecosystem where Amphicelius lived, there were lots of large sauropods that would also have needed to eat a lot of vegetation. Mm -hmm. 
They were the ones who said they thought there was a typographical error when it came to the size of the Amphicelius material. They said Cope had a lot of typographical errors in his work, and sometimes he even said the species was fragilimus, and sometimes he called it fragilismus. Oh no, Cope. It could be partly why much more of Cope's dinosaur names got synonymized later than Marsh's. Mm, could be. In 2006, Carpenter wrote, quote, there's every reason to suspect that Amphicelius fragilimus was indeed one of the largest, if not the largest, dinosaur to ever walk the earth, end quote. I also should mention it's accepted that Cope did describe a large vertebra and that it belonged to a giant dinosaur. So we don't think that this fossil was made up. No. So the Amphicelius fragilimus fragmentary vertebra Might have been more like 1.5 meters or 4.9 feet high. Yeah, and it was incomplete too. So what full size it would have been when it had that neural spine, if it was complete on the top of it, is unknown. But even at that point, one and a half meters or five feet is a huge vertebra. I mean, our vertebra are like one inch, maybe two (laughs) inches. So this is still so much bigger. Carpenter said that there's every reason to accept Cope at his word here. He never made any corrections in later publications. Marsh also never called him out, and we know that Marsh took every opportunity (laughs) to call Cope out. Yeah. And Osborne and Mook accepted these measurements in 1921, as did McIntosh in 1998. It's strange, though, that Cope didn't mention Amphicelius fragilimus in any more scientific papers after he described it. Cope did say that the specimen was delicate and required great care, so it's possible that the fossil crumbled and then was discarded. No. Even if they just kept the pieces, that would have been so helpful. Well, it might have gotten lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Carpenter estimated Amphicelius fragilimus weighed around 122,400 kilograms, that's about 135 tons, based on scaled up proportions of Diplodocus. In 2006, Carpenter also studied the paleobiology of sauropods and suggested that their large sizes made them more efficient in digesting food, similar to elephants and rhinoceros. And that's because they had longer digestive systems and could digest food over a long period of time, which would help them survive on lower quality plants. Yeah, so that goes to say that they wouldn't have had to like decimate all the edible mm-hmm. <laughs> foliage in the region. Or that they didn't require special, very highly nutritious plants. Carpenter also suggested that other benefits of being large, like being safer from predators, not having to use as much energy, and living longer, were secondary benefits compared to this digestion reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's that never-ending question of why were sauropods just that big. Yeah. Maybe it was because that was the best bioreactor, the best fermentation pit in their stomach. Or just because they could be. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Amphicelius lived in a savanna-like environment. It probably ate ferns. The Amphicelius fragilimus vertebra was lost sometime when Cope sold his fossils to the American Museum of Natural History. However, it was still assigned an AMNH catalog number, even though it was never seen at the museum, because Cope apparently never numbered anything, so they numbered everything based on notes, and then the idea was to assign it once the fossil turned up. Oh, Cope, what are you doing? <laughs> the more I learn about Cope, the more I'm on Team Marsh. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They both have their pros and cons, for sure. <laughs> never naming or numbering a fossil is a pretty big con. <laughs> So it was cataloged, Amphicelius fragilimus was cataloged as AMNH 5777. In 1921, Osborne and Mook provisionally synonymized Amphicelius fragilimus with Amphicelius altus, saying that Amphicelius fragilimus was a large individual of Amphicelius altus. They wrote, quote, The type of the species has not been found in the Cope collection and its characters cannot be clearly determined, end quote. So it was lost pretty early on. Mm-hmm. In 2018, Kenneth Carpenter renamed Amphicelius fragilimus as Mara punisaurus, and we covered this back in episode 210. When Carpenter named Mara punisaurus, he made some new estimates on the fossil, mainly that the vertebra was about 2.4 meters tall instead of 2.7, and Mara punisaurus, formerly Amphicelius fragilimus, was about 99 to 105 feet or 
30.3 to 32 meters long. Yeah, if I remember right, it's because that really tall vertebra, they were scaling the length based on animals that basically had smaller vertebra proportionally to their length. Mm -hmm. But there are some similar sauropods that just have really tall vertebra. So when you compare it to those dinosaurs, then it's like, okay, well, it didn't have to be that crazy long. Even if it was that big of a vertebra, it turns out that that's not that crazy for a sauropod. Right. And it could have basically been in the range of normal sauropod lengths because 100 feet is like, yeah, that's a, sauropods were that long pretty often. It's got a lot going for it for why we thought that though was an early find in mm-hmm. the Bone Wars and then it got lost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then people didn't really talk that much about it and like re-estimate its size because it was like, why would you bother? You can't see the bone. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that's, that Kenneth Carpenter looked at it and did that analysis so that it, at least now we know, okay, yeah, it wasn't this 200 foot. We didn't lose this bone for this hugest sauropod ever, most amazing thing. It makes it a little bit less tragic that we lost that fossil. Mm-hmm. So there's been some species debates around Amphicelius. In 2010, Henry Galliano and Raymond Albersdorfer had a paper that referred fossils found in the Bighorn Basin in the Morrison Formation in Wyoming. These fossils were from a private collection, and they referred them to a new species, Amphicelius brontodiplodocus. Brontodiplodocus. Yes. That's a great species name. Well... Yes, although it's not a real species name. So they hypothesized that most diplodocids found in the Morrison Formation represented different growth stages or sexual dimorphism and that they were all amphicelius. Wow, that's quite a hypothesis. Yes, but this paper was never formally published, and then the lead author even later said that it was just a drafted manuscript. Okay. Well, yeah, if it didn't go through peer review, it Mm -hmm. doesn't count as anything. Yes. In 2007, John Foster suggested that the features of Amphicelius altus that made it unique might just be because of individual variation, and that Amphicelius may be a senior synonym of Diplodocus. A senior synonym? That should just make it the name. (laughs) Well, let me get into that. So in 2015, Woodruff and Foster made the same suggestion that there's only one species of Amphicelius and it could be referred to Diplodocus. Huh. They suggested that the differences between all the species was due to ontogeny growth and that the fossils for Amphicelius altus was an immature specimen and the fossils for Amphicelius fragilimus were from a more mature specimen. And because of this, they suggested that Amphicelius fragilimus should be synonymized to Amphicelius altus. They also said that there weren't legitimate unique features for Amphicelius altus, and they supported referring all Amphicelius material to Diplodocus altus. Because Amphicelius was named first, that's what makes it the senior synonym, Hmm. Diplodocus would become Amphicelius, but they said Amphicelius should be a nomum obletum. And that's a name that hasn't been used scientifically for more than 50 years after originally being named, and it's been replaced by a more recent name that is commonly used, and that the name should stay Diplodocus. Oh, that's a bummer. (laughs) (laughs) It would be fun to have a controversy of Diplodocus wasn't a real dinosaur. Then it would be like Brontosaurus. Yeah. It would be like, oh yeah, Diplodocus is also just uh, Amphicelius. Although now some people say Brontosaurus is a valid genus again. I didn't know nomum obletums were even an option until this. I do remember, I think there's another term for it too, basically meaning it's an abandoned name, Mm -hmm. which is what this is. And I could see too, they were saying that there aren't the unique features on Amphicelius, the specimens that we have, and we're even missing completely some of the species. So it would make sense that you would want to use Diplodocus as a neotype, but that almost makes me feel like that Diplodocus neotype is a neotype of Amphicelius, mm. but I I understand we've got Diplodocids. kids. There's so much use of Diplodocus and Diplodocids kids and all that stuff in the scientific literature. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really make sense to rewrite all of that over the, you know, right. It would get more confusing. Yeah, and the whole point of this is supposed to be not to be confusing and to make communication about it clear. So yeah, rewriting it all as Amphicelius is probably not worth it, even though it would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in 2021, Philip Mannion, Emmanuel Schopp, and John Whitlock redescribed Amphicelius altus, and they found Amphicelius altus to be valid. So oh, that's man. how we got the type species that's the only valid species now. Back again. <laughs> yes. 
The American Museum of Natural History got the Amphicelius altus fossils back in 1902, and according to the museum, they're the earliest recovered fossils currently in their collection. Hmm. The team in 2021 analyzed the fossils, and they found three features that have to do with the shape of the vertebrae and femur that make Amphicelius a valid taxon. So again, type and only species is Amphicelius altus. If that even counts. <laughs> it just came back one year ago after not being being lumped in with the Diplodocus. So who knows how long that'll last. Uh, I think it counts. The right femur is currently in three pieces, but it's mostly complete in length. The team said they couldn't get permission to do histology, but based on the size of the femur, they think the individual was an adult. It's unclear if it was a young adult and still growing or an older adult, but there were no features, quote, associated with advanced age. Okay. Well, it would make sense either way, because what was it? It was in like 50, 60 feet? Is that what you said? Yeah. So yeah, that could be uh, either way, because some sauropods got a lot bigger than that, and a lot of them were adults at that size. Yes. They found that only the holotype represented Amphicelius altus. There are no referred specimens. So there's just the one species and the, it's represented by one specimen. And they also found that there was probably even more diversity in sauropods in the Morrison formation than we previously thought. Nice. Amphicelius is one of those dinosaurs that I feel like most dino nerds know from that history of being considered the biggest ever dinosaur. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's no longer considered the biggest ever if it's even considered its own genus. Well, we have since found some very large titanosaurs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like you were just talking about Australotitan. Mm -hmm. That one was likely bigger than Amphicelius. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash or click the link on the left.